In September 2023, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un traveled to Russia for a meeting with Vladimir Putin. The topic of this discussion would come as no surprise. Russia needed allies to support their invasion of Ukraine, and North Korea was one of the few remaining friends they had on the international stage. What was interesting about this meeting, though, was the location. Kim did not travel to Moscow. He met Putin at a spaceport, the Vostochny Cosmodrome. It's a modern launch site in eastern Russia that is home to the Soyuz-2 rocket. One year later, in the fall of 2024, the first North Korean soldiers appeared on the front lines. Now here's the thing. No one goes to war for nothing, and it's pretty clear what North Korea is looking to get in return for sending their men to die in Ukraine. Kim Jong-un loves rockets, so much so that it earned him a nickname from US President Donald Trump, Little Rocket Man. But this ambition has been a hallmark of the Kim dynasty for a long time. The first North Korean space program was established around 1980 under the leadership of Kim Il-sung. The goal was for the nation to begin developing its own satellites and rocket launch technology. That includes construction of the first launch site called Tonghe on the northeastern coast. But progress is slow. In 1985, there's not much there aside from a launch pad and a bunker, more symbolic than functional. In the mid-90s, Kim Il-sung passes away, and his son Kim Jong-il takes over leadership of North Korea. This is where progress on the space program begins to accelerate. Kim Jong-il introduces his three pillars of power and prosperity. He makes science and technology one of these pillars, and the other two are ideology and military strength. The Tonghe spaceport gets a major upgrade in the mid-90s. It quadruples in size with the addition of a rocket assembly plant, fuel storage, and ground-based tracking system. At the same time, construction also begins on a second launch site, Sohei. This one is on the northwestern coast, closer to the capital Pyongyang, closer to China. Again, construction is slow, but Sohei will eventually grow to five times the size of Tonghe and include an engine test site along with a sophisticated mission control center. Now, the spaceport is useless without a rocket, so what does that look like in North Korea? As with every other space program in the world, North Korea has evolved out of long-range ballistic missile technology, and all roads lead back to Nazi Germany in World War II. A German scientist named Werner von Braun creates the V-2 missile. It has a powerful rocket engine that can send a bomb flying high above the Earth's atmosphere and then rain down destruction on the cities of Europe. After the war, von Braun defects to America, and they put him in charge of building rockets for NASA. Meanwhile, the Soviet army got their hands on the next best thing, V-2 blueprints and rocket hardware. They immediately start building their own copy, the R-1. The R-1 missile evolved into an improved version that the Soviets called the R-11, but the rest of the world refers to as the Scud missile. The Scud is famous for being the most widely available ballistic missile in history. They cranked out somewhere around 7,000 of these things during the Cold War era, and those ended up getting traded around the Middle East and North Africa until Scud missiles could be found just about anywhere. However, it would take a while until the Scud made its way into North Korea. They weren't exactly tight with the Soviet Union, so it ends up being Egypt that supplies North Korea with their first ballistic missiles. It was a sort of thank you present for North Korean support during the Yom Kippur War with Israel in the early 70s. So now, just like so many other countries before them, North Korea has the technology to blow people up from very far away. And they like that. They like it a lot. The Kim dictators become infamous for these epic military parades where they roll big missile launchers through the town square of Pyongyang. But also, just like so many nations before them, North Korean scientists start trying to figure out how to make even bigger and more destructive missiles. The interesting thing about a really big missile and a satellite launching rocket is that they are pretty much the exact same thing. And if you're gonna build one, then you might as well do both, because a space program is also a flex. And if there's one thing we know for sure about the North Korean government, it's that they love to flex. So the Kims 
have officially entered the space race. This takes some time, but in August 1998, the first ever North Korean-made orbital rocket is placed on the launch pad at Tonghe. They call this rocket Tipodong. It's essentially just a bigger version of the Scud missile, but it manages to lift off successfully and flies to an altitude of around 200 kilometers. North Korea claims this launch as a success, deploying their first satellite into orbit. Western observers disagree. The payload definitely reached space, but failed to insert itself into a stable orbit. It probably just fell back down a couple of days later. It would be nine years before North Korea was ready to launch again from Tonghe, this time with a new rocket, the Anha. It means galaxy in North Korean, and it was essentially just a slightly bigger and more powerful version of what they already had. However, this one is capable enough to finally grab the attention of the United Nations, who urge North Korea to cancel any testing of the Anha, basically saying it's a little too close to an intercontinental ballistic missile for comfort. Even Russia advises Kim Jong-il not to do this. But he does it anyway. In April 2009, Anha lifts off successfully. Again, it flies to space. Again, the North Koreans claim success at putting a satellite into orbit. And again, the Western observers say that it failed to reach orbit and debris ended up in the Pacific Ocean. This is where Kim Jong-un enters the picture, Little Rocket Man. Just one year after his father's death in 2011, the third dictator of North Korea is pushing harder than ever to gain momentum with his nation's space program. In April 2012, we see the first launch from the new spaceport at Sohei. Another Anha rocket lifts off, but this one goes even worse than before. The rocket explodes in mid-air shortly after launch. This was supposed to be a celebration for the 100th birthday of North Korea's founder Kim Il-sung, but it turned out to be a rough start for his grandson's time in power. Kim Jong-un was undeterred, and he pushed his country's rocket scientists harder than ever before. By December 2012, they were back on the launch pad with another Anha rocket, from two launches in nine years to two launches in one year. And the second time was the charm. North Korea successfully deploys their first satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit at around 500 kilometers altitude. It's an Earth observation satellite, and North Korean media immediately reports that they are already using it to spy on American military bases. Again, people who can look at space with a telescope dispute this, saying that the satellite is definitely in orbit, but it's also tumbling out of control in a way that it couldn't possibly observe anything useful. Even still, the UN was not happy about North Korea's rocket ambitions. In 2013, they hit the nation with new sanctions, essentially making North Korea even more isolated and cut off from the world than ever before. Then in February 2013, North Korea conducted an underground nuclear weapons test, which just made everything worse. And to close out the year, Kim Jong-un assassinated his own uncle. So he was obviously pretty busy around this time, and satellite launches kind of fell by the wayside for a little while. It's not until February 2016 that we see another Anha rocket launch. The timing of this launch is mostly symbolic as it lines up with the 75th birthday of Kim Jong-un's father, but it would mark the first truly successful satellite launch from North Korea. The rocket deployed another observation platform into sun-synchronous orbit, and it worked flawlessly. The satellite is able to return photographs from orbit to the ground. But again, the North Korean space program goes silent for a long time. They just can't seem to build any momentum. Western intelligence says that they are working on a new and improved rocket design, but there's not much progress being made. That is until 2023, when everything changes. The same year that Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin have their meeting at the Russian spaceport and finalize an agreement on how North Korea is going to help invade Ukraine. Now, is this actually about space, or is this about Kim Jong-un arming himself for World War III? Well, both, really. And that's the way these things have always gone. The Soviet Union didn't start out building rockets and space capsules, they were building gigantic intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads for the very specific purpose of incinerating the United States. But if the war never comes, then you don't want all that work to just go to waste. So you might as well have a space program while you're at it. 
And that way, if the world doesn't end up in a flaming apocalypse, then you still get to look cool and impressive. So in May 2023, North Korea rolls out their new rocket for the first time. This one is named Cholima, after a mythical Korean horse that's known as a symbol of speed and power. This one is entirely different from the Unha. It's no longer based on the Scud missile, but it's not exactly a North Korean original either. The engine design of the Cholima first stage booster is said to have a striking resemblance to the Soviet RD-250, which is a relatively small dual nozzle rocket engine built in the mid-1960s. It's not entirely clear how a bunch of surplus Soviet rocket engines found their way into North Korea, but it also doesn't require too much imagination to make a guess. When Cholima launched for the first time, the new booster stage performed flawlessly, but the rocket experienced a failure with the second stage. The engine above the booster that was supposed to carry the payload further into space didn't start, and the whole thing fell back down and landed in the ocean. When they launched Chalima again in August 2023, the first and second stage of the rocket performed well, but the third stage engine failed during the orbital insertion burn. So what we can gather is that the North Koreans are using reliable Soviet engines for their booster stage on the new rocket, but the upper stages are using something much less proven. North Korean media blamed the upper stage failures on a new engine with an unstable fuel type. No one really knows what that means, but it might indicate that they are using a more original design that's not working out so well. Now we get to the third launch of Cholima in November 2023, and everything finally goes according to plan. All three rocket stages work as intended and a new military spy satellite is deployed into sun-synchronous orbit. Two months after Kim's meeting with Putin, and suddenly, their rocket problems are solved. We know that something big changed around this time for North Korea's space program, because in May 2024, they have yet another brand new rocket on the launch pad at Sohei, and this one is far more advanced than Cholima. It's a giant leap to make in just one year. Instead of the self-combusting hypergolic propellant engine that you'd find in an average ballistic missile, this new rocket is using cryogenic liquid oxygen and kerosene fuel, just like what you'd see in a SpaceX Falcon 9 or a Russian Soyuz. It's not cutting edge technology, but it is industry standard for 2024, and you have to wonder how North Korea was able to catch up seemingly overnight. Okay, maybe you don't have to wonder that hard. Anyway, just because they acquired or invented a brand new engine doesn't instantly make the North Koreans into genius rocket scientists. Their new vehicle exploded in mid-air just a few seconds after liftoff. And that is all we know. They didn't even say what this new rocket was called or what it was carrying on board. The level of secrecy involved is at an all-time high and it's always been pretty damn high. Now, it's also not surprising that they had new problems with a cryogenic-fueled rocket. This is a lot more complicated. It requires the liquid oxygen to be held at temperatures below negative 100 degrees. And when that super-chilled liquid hits the engine, the rapid change in temperature can throw the entire fuel delivery system into chaos. The biggest surprise, really, is that they haven't tried again since. But we also know that they haven't given up. Satellite images from June 2025 show that there was a large rocket engine tested at Sohei for the first time since summer 2024. There's also been new construction around the launch site, including the expansion of a factory known to produce rocket engines and a new tunnel that would connect the launch pad to a nearby rail line. So we know that Kim Jong-un is cooking up something, and we know he's not in the kitchen alone. Now, what comes next?